if, if anything, there could be a small fear of buying it at the top because you're hearing all these things like, oh my gosh, there's got to be some correction. There's got to be a recession coming. There's got to be bad news on the horizon. So there's some people fearing, well, should this be a time where I, I take a step back? But then if they look at history, any time where it was like, oh, let's sit on the sidelines, it just kept running, kept running, kept running. But also I feel there's this other fear where they know everything they see around them is that you can't grow your income and you can't grow your net worth at a pace to keep up. At any pace to keep up other than through real estate. So, gosh, do I wish I bought a few years ago? Yes. Am I scared about the future? Yes. Am I not liking my rate relative to before? Yes. But am I looking around and seeing my net worth literally depreciate in value because of all this inflation? You're stressing me out just listening. I'm just, it's like, it's, it's all fear. It's all fear. It's, it's, stressful a, it's a very buy. fearful when, thing. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. All right, it's Thursday, Master Keys Podcast. I'm Chandler. I'm Neil. Thanks as always as uh, thanks as always for tuning in. Guys revved. There we go. I'm a little um, revved, a little jacked up. Um, it's been today, a crazy week. Mark's still psycho. But. Yeah, Mark's still psycho. Today we're talking about psychology of real estate. Yeah. What that looks like for a buyer's head or in a buyer's head. In and a, a seller's, seller's head, head right now. Yeah. And then the, I think the one that we all want to know is inside of an investor and what we think you should do. I think that's kind well, of our opinion. I say what we think because I was going to say what you should do. And I was like, no, 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 no. We have to preface this with what we think you should do. Well, every um, time someone has a question about the market, they're like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And then that happens. Like, what you don't understand is real estate, there's so much of it, especially on the residential side, obviously, that's driven by psychology. Yeah. Which means you can't explain it away by, well, the rates did this. So this one thing should happen. Or this is going on with supply and demand. So this one thing should happen. When you bring in emotion, when you bring in psychology, all of those things, it's a bit harder to predict. Okay, well, with that being said, I think there is a direct correlation to what's taking place that was rate-based. Oh, for sure, um, for sure. And we saw it at the start of the year, rates flew off the handle, market froze. Then there was a pullback on rates. Now, not mm -hmm. formally, like the, the rate announcement, the, the Bank of Canada rate did not drop, but the bond yields went down, which mm -hmm. meant long-term money got cheaper. Yeah. And so people were able to get a five-year fixed product for less than they were able to get a one or a two-year product. They were able to get five-year fixed, if especially with CMHG, right down to like four and a half. Like there were people signing at 449, 469, which isn't that bad, and they were able to get qualified. And again, there was a moment where there, there was a brief and time. that's going on right now. Yeah. And that, that even in itself look, speaks to the psychology of it because for a while, when fixed rates were available in the mid threes or the low threes, brutal. the psychology out there was, well, now I don't want to take a rate of 4.5 because that's a ripoff, mm -hmm. right? And then now the psychology switches that, I my gosh, people would die for, rate. for a 4.5 rate. And that's that makes sense for obvious reasons, but it's interesting to see how that recency bias and that relativism messes with people's heads because everyone at that time was so angry that their friend had a certain rate and now one, they were having to get this 1. rate. 7. <laughs> yeah. And well, now that that shoe was on the other proverbial foot um, and it just speaks to how, you know, the, the emotion, the guttural, the psychological like any, outweighs into it. Anything to do with money, any yeah. investment, anything like, in the, like stocks, the same thing. They move on sentiment a lot of the time. For sure. Uh, after they, they follow um, like actual principle rules. Um, yeah. And so. that's not to say that these other things don't inherently matter. I'm just saying in addition to that, like real estate is not the vacuum that economists might wish it or imagine it to be. There's all these other things involved. And I think, I think if, they wish it. I think they wish it. I think everyone knows it's not, but I think it's more the idea of like, how the hell do we cool this thing down without it exploding in everyone's face? And they're like, well, we just have to keep cranking the rates because nobody seems to listen or understand what's going on. So, they're doing it to themselves. And even then, the, the problem that created is as soon as the rate stopped, as soon as there was yeah, a little pullback. Everyone started going fire again. It's like, man, they jacked the gas up to two bucks, and now you think it's a deal when it goes down to 189, right? And that's I the problem of what we've created. On that note, I was filling up the other day, and it was like a buck 67. I was like, well, you know. Oh, man. That's not so bad. A couple weeks ago, it was like a buck 50. And it's like, oh, man. Yeah. Fill her up. Fill yeah. the whole damn tank. It, uh, it felt good, but you're right. It's because it was I was literally paying over $2 at one point in time. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get into that. and But let's start with the whole idea. I mean, if someone's curious about how real estate begins with psychology, think of how we price things. You never see anything priced at 500 grand. It's always at 499.9. 
right? And even that, as mm. silly as it is, sales. that is the start of the sales and, and the psychological part of real estate listings. Yeah. It's same too with, it's cliched, but the way a house smells, right? Mm. You know, the old, oh, let's cook a, a thing of Dude, baked this, cookies or whatever. I remember when I was a kid, my parents were selling their house and my mom uh, would take a pot and throw cinnamon sticks. Mm-hmm. We'd boil the water. We'd boil the water. Yeah. And then I remember like we'd be tidying. She'd be tidying up the house and I'd run around the house with the steaming hot water, cinnamon water pot. And I'd Just run through the... Just spritzing it. <laughs> <laughs> Just running around the house, making it smell like fresh baked stuff. And then I'd throw it into the oven. So it was just sitting yeah. in the oven, like kind of steaming. And so the whole house smelt like cinnamon. Um, totally. I, Sensory stuff and the color scheme as well. You know, you paint your house a different color when it's time to sell calming colors and all this stuff treats are i honestly don't know if that's a good thing or not because you might get distracted but i know as an agent like when i was running around doing 20 showings in a day and i walked in and there was a tray of cookies i was like hells yeah you should buy this house like this is yeah like respect i would tag sometimes the listing agent like tell your sellers that they are the bomb well i would uh, you know what i kind of like these sellers i make a joke (laughs) about it but it does feel good to buy a home off of sellers you think you like um the one thing that sort of swung back the pendulum the other way is now there's this block with buyers. Tell me if you feel the same where they almost want it to feel like no one has ever lived in the house. Right. So it's staged kind of cold. It's minimalist. It is neutral. It is unoffensive. It is completely depersonalized. I think that's a new generation. That's everything we expect it to be new. We want everything new, new cars, like new technology. We get new. We've always had new. Like, it's just like that idea. I also think that people feel awkward around other people more so than they ever did. So the idea that someone else has lived in this house makes them feel weird. Right? Like gross. People don't want to pick up the phone call. They don't want to feel like they're living in a space that someone else lived in. So now I find the food smells, because people ask me about that. I'm like, no, don't do it. The best smell you can have, I tell them. Febreze, say, Mr. Clean. Paint. I go with paint. I say, you paint the inside trim of your front entryway so people walk in and smell fresh paint. Just They're like, ooh, this house is tidy. Get high as hell in the fumes and they yeah. just roll into that house. <laughs> some huff some, uh, huff some <laughs> have dollar a paint, 60 have gas. A paint chips you can chew on while you walk around. Yeah. Um, so like, there's psychology in the whole selling part of the industry. And let's be honest, that's a big part of it, especially when you talk about the first-time home buyers or at least the residential single-family home buyer. Like, that drives a lot of the market. The thing I want to know is what the psychology of the seller is, but are we going to first go into a talk a little bit at high level of the buyer, and then do we want to... Well... I want to know what people are thinking, all right? I'm, cinnamon sticks are dope, but I want to... Well, what where are, are people been, at right now? Well, the last... My gosh. For buyers, I would say the prevailing sentiment of the last four years has been FOMO, right? Fear of, of missing out. Yeah. Right. This runaway freight train of, oh my gosh, I need to get on the ladder. I need to get on the ladder. I need to get on the ladder. So mm-hmm. I think that's been the driving psychology behind behind buyers lately, last four years. Yeah. And I, I think it's a mixed bag because there was also, I think there was a, a period there, maybe a little more local to Atlantic Canada, but there was a period where it was cheaper to buy than it was to rent. Oh, yeah, there was a window, but there was it was there was a pretty big I, window for about two years there. Like, yeah, especially at the start man. of COVID. Um, that is rates were low. Two evils right now, but yeah, rates were low, and so you could be like, hmm, I could buy a townhouse for three hundred fifty k. My payments are fifteen hundred bucks a month. Yeah, or I can rent a one or two bedroom apartment for fifteen hundred for fifteen hundred bucks a month. Yeah, and I own this place. Uh, and then it became the bonus of like, like that was the original driving factor, and then like a year later, like. Dude, my neighbor's townhouse just sold for six hundred grand, and we only I bought three fifty, mm-hmm. and then they have all their, their friends over, and they're like, "So I'm a professional investor. I made a quarter million dollars this year." Mm-hmm. And then I think the FOMO kicks in, where people are like, "Big time, this motherfucker!" I guess I bleep that part out, but this guy just made two hundred fifty grand on this place. Yeah, Carl over here, Carl. this idiot Carl, <laughs> this idiot Carl, yeah. <laughs> who got approved because his mom co-signed on the deal. And then I think it yeah. started to rip where people, I think that was like maybe 2021, it went full FOMO market where everyone knew someone. Yeah. And it was just like psychotic. Also, because again, 2020 rates were just like ridiculous. It was just like, a, it was a race to the bottom. Yeah. And at its worst, that becomes this idea of the greater fool principle. I don't know if people have heard that out there where effectively it's a hot potato. You know, you're buying your home purely on the speculative idea that one day you'll be able to sell it more to someone who's a greater fool than you. And people keep trading hands as this way of building uh, net worth, but at some point maybe it pops and, and it collapses and that's the greater fool S- principle. 
So where do buyers sit now? How well, has that hot potato progressed? I think there's right now this real kind of uh, balance or, or these conflicting emotions between, you know, yes, I have this fear of missing out, which is always there. But I, I think that's slowing down because some people are like, well, this is just ridiculous. Me missing out on something that is incredibly expensive and maybe very challenging for me to do doesn't make me actually feel anymore like I'm missing out. I was with some buddies today who are all in the financial sector, all in banking, actually. And we were talking about how, my gosh, the least stressful thing that you could have right now is being a renter on a rent control department. Like that is the least stressful situation probably (laughs) in terms of, you know, on its own in a vacuum, that's probably the least stressful position right now. So maybe there isn't as much FOMO right now of missing out on this ramp up. If, If anything, there could be a small fear of buying it at the top because you're hearing all these things like, Oh my gosh, there's gotta be some correction. There's gotta be a recession coming. There's gotta be bad news on the horizon. So there's some people fearing, well, should, should this be a time where I I take a step back? But then if they look at history, any time where it was like, Oh, let's sit on the sidelines. It just kept running, kept running, kept running. But also I feel there's this other fear where they know everything they see around them is that you can't grow your income and you can't grow your net worth at a pace to keep up. At any pace to keep up, other than through real estate. So, gosh, do I wish I bought a few years ago? Yes. Am I scared about the future? Yes. Am I not liking my rel- rate relative to before? Yes. But am I looking around and seeing my net worth literally depreciate in value because of all this inflation? You're stressing me out just listening. I'm just, it's like, it's, it's all fear. It's all fear. It's a, it's a, it's a very fearful thing. But the part that's, Crazy to me. It's a very stressful time to buy, and everything you just said, the shit's humming. Oh man, it's humming out there, baby. It's humming. Like, it's like, but there's more terminations because I think that is that balance between the fear of, gosh, I feel we'll I should like do this because everything I've been taught is like, oh, buy real estate, it's great, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's more expensive than I thought, more expensive month to month, and more expensive ticket price. Mm-hmm. And I'm feeling this anxiety because I'm getting. This news over here that says we're, we're due for a correction. Well, this news over here says the market's humming. It is a lot of things to balance right now if you are a buyer. And yeah, stressful would, would be the word, I would say. And then as an agent, you're trying to navigate this too. And think of how many times you heard these ones. Like, what was what was the go-to? I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, no. And and uh, shut us bigger pockets or, or no, it wasn't. I think it was Dad at uh, Delhi. This, this guy, he's phenomenal. Um, and he was riffing on this the other day. So what was the go-to phrase? when people were talking about um, the rates. Like, oh, you know, rates are up. Like, should I not buy? Like, what was well, the catchphrase? That you're getting a discount on the house? Well, no, there's that one, but... but What was it? Date the rate, marry oh, the house. Oh, yeah, yeah. Date the rate, marry the house. These rates are looking like a bit longer commitment than you may this have thought. Is, this might be an engagement to your rate. You're, in, you're engaged. You are in a... An, you're in a common law relationship, and this thing it's can It's not sink healthy. You, yeah. this, this can sink you just as badly as one of those can. Yeah, you are in a toxic relationship with that rate currently. Um, <laughs> it's, so, it's, you know, that was... But that was the go-to, right? Because at the end of the day, we, real estate agent, and, and let's put on our real estate agent hat for a second, we are in sales. And we talked about all the psychology of pricing, presentation, smells, sensory, all this stuff. And with, when you're working with buyers, you are trying to keep their energy up. You're trying to keep them positive because they're getting beaten and battered. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to come up with these things to give people perspective and give them context. That one maybe is not aging well. That date the rate, marry the house is not I'm aging well. I've never or, or said like, that. I don't, what I don't, goes say, I don't say corny I can bring shit, I don't say corny either, shit like but, that. Um, you know, there's, it, it's a hard... Like, look, bro, marry this rate for five years. Take, make it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but I'm, I'm just saying like, there's that psychology of trying to sell place. And it's, it's been hard right now because as an agent, you don't really know what to, to kind of, um, <laughs> leverage, <tell>. but, <laughs> and uh, yeah, there, so, there's no right answer right now. And it's, it, it's going to go. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'm seeing too, and I'm just gonna add to the buyer mindset is again, like you said, the hesitancy, but then also I'm finding people are way more okay when they don't get a deal. Because like you said, I think mm-hmm. people are anxious submitting mm-hmm. an offer. Like, oh, there's six offers. They're anxiously doing it, which is also why it's leading to more terminations, like you said. But then when you contact them and, and are like, it, like, you didn't get the deal, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, that, that's okay. I'll sit. I can yeah, sit yeah. for a minute. Um, they feel a little more like, that's okay. That's what I could like, yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was, I was stretching it there. And like, I don't feel great about where it was. And like, if people are having to take variable product to get approved, they're like, well, now I'm starting to hear that there might be some more rate hikes. So 
uh, yeah, I think the buyer mentality as a whole is confidence is waning. Um, there's people still shopping aggressively because inventory is a problem. Um, I think, again, we're having more of a hyper, hyper local feel where Atlantic Canada is doing really, really well. I think some parts, a other parts of the markets can- are doing pretty well. They're all man. doing, they are all doing, I think, pretty well. But I was talking to people in Ontario and they already started to have a bit of a doom and gloom mentality. And, and I think it's starting to slow a little bit. Um, but all right, switching over to sellers. Okay. What the hell is the seller mindset? Well, the sellers have had so much leverage. The seller mindset for a while was just like cock of the walk, baby. Like they just were on cloud nine. You put over 500. I wanted six. So I just upped it to six. Super, you know, felt they had all the leverage in the world and they still they did. kind of feel that did. to some degree. But a lot of them aren't moving. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's something going on behind the curtain there. Of what's the psychology that's keeping people from moving? So like if, if you can cash in, why would you not just, why aren't these sellers selling and making all this profit right now? There's a bunch of people who I think are in fixed rates and they're like, I'm going to weather the storm. I'm going to mm-hmm. outlast these rate hikes. They're going to come back down around. If even if I have to bump up a little bit, I'll be in an okay spot. And I'm so far ahead of my house. So I, I want to go with that. And I don't want to be in a place where I have to sell and then rebuy at a new rate. Mm-hmm. And once you've owned, it's the psychology is it's a lot harder to give something up after you've already bought it. And so the idea mm-hmm. of then giving up to go to an apartment, right? Like mm-hmm. that feels like you're stepping back in your life. You're like, man, I was, I was on the train. I, I owned real estate. Now I'm giving this up to go try and rent in a, in a rental market. Mm-hmm. That's impossible. Yeah. I'm going to have a much smaller space. My monthlies might actually still get worse. Uh, and I might not be living where I want to be living. Like there's just so many little, so it's like, I'm not going to sell my house. The one thing I will say that I am seeing, and this is something we used to talk about about maybe four or five months ago, probably more like six, eight months ago, where sellers were not doing price changes. Hence why kind of the market, I think, froze up. They mm-hmm. just refused. They're like, mm-hmm. no, I have so much equity in my house. Why would I change the price? I'll just wait for my price. Yep. I think that now from the sellers I've talked with, we're getting a lot of people being like, so a price change. Yeah, no, let's let's do that. How much? Like they're okay, open to it. And then, and again, like you said, the, it's funny, like it is all psychology because it's like, to me, I always thought it was principles. Um, and I haven't seen enough of these cycles to be a part of it and really know otherwise. But when I was listing, when things were hot, people were like, I won't take less than 700 mm-hmm. and they wouldn't budge. They didn't give a shit. We wouldn't get that offer. We'd up the listing price to 700 and we would sit on that thing. And to be honest with you, a lot of times someone came around and bought it. Eventually. And and, yeah. and they would hold off. We get offers, it'd be like 700. We were at, we were at six, we up to seven. Someone gives us 675, no conditions, closing next week. And like, no, screw them. And then eventually that person would come back around and give us a seven. And I was like, oh my God, like I thought you were being ridiculous, but you got it. Now I'm seeing similar, similar people in like similar clients, all those things being like, well, you know, six doesn't sound so bad. And maybe if we have to do it with 550, like that's, that will mm-hmm. still close. Like we want to, we want to get this moved. Um, and so I think that mindset's starting to shift a little bit, um, depending on where your area is. Yeah. But I think there is starting to be consideration with like that, which I think is good for the market because it was an unhealthy market. Um, but I also think the seller mindset now, similar to what you said, is I've seen all the rate hikes. Um, and I think a lot of them who are in the houses are starting to maybe question the affordability of a home. And then they feel that they're like, well, if I'm struggling, how the hell is the next person going to get into this? Yeah. And, and I think the other one is, same concept. If you've already gotten something, it's really hard to give it up. If you've made what you felt like was a quarter million dollars and you know your neighbor's house sold for 800 in the peak of the market, you're like, shit, 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 shit. I want to capture that. Yeah. I don't want to be sitting here being like, the same oh, sort of Ted yeah. made same concept, whatever buddy's God name was. Damn it, Ted. Yeah. Ted got out at 800 and he cashed in that 250. Yeah. And I thought I was going to sit here and it was going to be a million bucks next year. Mm-hmm. And now it's looking like it's going to be 750, yeah. maybe. And so I should have actually sold when Ted sold. Um, and so I think there's that aspect starting to come online now too, where people are like, shit, I want to capture some of these gains. Cause it felt really good to be like, yeah, I got a half million dollars of equity in my house or a quarter million dollars of equity in my house. And now I might not, mm-hmm. I don't actually know what I have for equity in my house. Yeah. Uh, well, and those sellers that were deciding to sell it and, and we're still in that market to a large degree, the whole held offers was like the ultimate psychological warfare that the seller was playing mm-hmm. where, and, and buyers asked the whole time, like, why would they do this? What, what's the rationale and why do four days and not seven days or why do mm-hmm. four and not two? It's like, well, you don't understand as from a seller's perspective, you want to get 
as many people through there as possible, which means you got to give them like four days realistically. Mm -hmm. But you don't want it to be so long that they're spaced out because you want people to see, you want people to see that there's other people going through. You want them to be leaving the driveway and another car pulling in and there's one group still in the backyard. Mm -hmm. You want the buyers to feel that Mm -hmm. pressure and that urgency. And you create that urgency by a contracted amount of time. Then there's just the other thing where you don't want to give people too long to make a decision or to see something else to your point, right? You don't want someone to have that chance to be, you know, paralysis by analysis. You want them to see the home, be like, yes, I think this is a fit. There's a pressure. There's a deadline. I've got a couple days to consider it, but no, I need to come in, you know, aggressive because that gets their adrenaline up. And what do people do when they're, you know, in that moment of adrenaline and competition? Adrenalized. They're uh. adrenalized. <laughs> they're there to bid. Right. Yeah. So that was a huge psychological play and a psychological tool that sellers still have in this market right now. I want to give a story on that. I had a seller who was like, no, no, we're going to do 10 days or two weeks because I want everybody to see the house. That means more eyes, more bids. Mm, End of the two weeks. Too long. I was calling all the agents. Everyone like forgot the date yes, or like, like oh, it moved what? on oh, to yeah, other yeah. properies. Or like yeah. you said, it's the same thing. This is the biggest purchase of someone's life. They're going to talk themselves out of it because if they're yep. sitting there and at first like, Hell yeah, I love this house. I want this house. They're not really thinking like, okay, it's me five hundred fifty thousand dollars. And then like after a week, like, well, then I have no savings in my account, and mm-hmm. I'm also got this big. And like, payment. you know what? I don't think it had a pantry. I don't remember because we were in and out of there in ten minutes. But now yeah. they go in the picture, like, it doesn't have a pantry. Yeah, that was a deal breaker for me. I yeah. remember I said it way back when, pantry's deal breaker. Yeah. And so now it's you know it, it's totally man. That was a, a it's a tool. It's a very valuable tool, and it frigging works. Here's another anecdotal example and how many times has this happened you're trying to explain to a seller that if they price at 499 they will likely get their 550 in the competitive market however if they price at 550 they might actually struggle because 435 yeah because people or 535 will think that oh my gosh it's not at 550 they probably want you know 600 yep and so you're constantly juggling that on the selling side what what tool how do you position the home to send the right message to these buyers who can kind of be fickle because then there's the psychology of if that home's not gone in five years, what does the buyer say? Or five days, what's the buyer say? There's something wrong with there's it. There's something wrong with that house. Yeah. For sure. I can't possibly buy the house that no one else wants. I must be an idiot. <laughs> and it is, again, yeah, it's psychological it's, warfare out there. Um, with that being said, actually on pricing, what are you suggesting right now? Oh, I'm going a little bit. Well, I want 500 grand. My house is worth every bit of 500. Your house is worth every bit of uh, 500 grand. I would say let's go in there around 479. Let's not go so low that we're relying on the market to do all the heavy lifting for us, but let's make it an obvious situation where someone is going to say, okay, a little bit over. That home's worth 500. I feel comfortable doing that. Because right now, a lot of buyers, some of them are feeling, one, yes, they want to bid and they want to be competitive and they want to go over. But my gosh, do they want to go as far over? right? They're kind of getting a little bit more restrained in that respect. And some of that is the rate, obviously, but some of it also is, I think, the psychology and, and not knowing what could be coming down the pipe. So I'm similar, but I'm, I'm suggesting a little lower pricing. And I agree to what you're saying about two months ago, because I so we had our, um, <laughs> the great, the great COVID growth and mm-hmm. went nuts. And then right at the peak, it was like, if you wanted a million, all you had to price, like you were, well, if your house was worth 500, you put up for 500 and you got a million bucks. Like people were just double bidding on houses. It was, it was psycho, yeah. okay? April, 2022. And then we had, I'd say a little bit of a pullback. Um, depending where you were, it was a little bigger. Yeah. Q4 was, was a great time to buy last year. Yep. And then level for Q1 of this year. And now we're back in this, we were back in this rise. Mm-hmm. To me, it feels like we're at kind of the, the tipping point where it's the, the steepest it's going to be again. And because of that, I think you can price a little low and people are back to feeling comfortable to bid mm-hmm. up because it's been now about probably eight weeks of, of overbidding again, I'd say. Eight weeks? Oh, yeah. It's, it's been eight weeks. Eight to ten weeks of people bidding over ask. And so I think yeah. people now are also back in that mindset again where it's like, because I think, again, six weeks ago, bidding over ask had just resumed. And so people were being conservative on their over ask bids. Now, like I think, I forget, there was one that just sold recently and they put it up at... I've seen a couple go over 100 over ask. Oh, Effectively yeah. is where yeah. I'm going with this. And so I'm I'm thinking, again, I'm, I'm recommending to clients, like, let's go, like, we were 20 under. Now maybe let's do, like, 40, or 35 under, or 30 mm-hmm. under. Like, you know what I mean? Just get a little more to, to again, to push that last little bit of traction because we're, we're in a crazy mode again. Yeah. Um, but 
that's just that's my thought. I don't think either is right or wrong. That's just that's my how I feel about it. Yeah, no, I, I know entirely what you mean. This particular moment right now that we're in, where um, there's again really strong buyer frenzy, big shortage of of supply. And we're going to talk a bit more about that because I think we want to delve into the seller psychology more in, in a bit. Um, there's also this weird thing going on, and this happened as the rates first started going up. When the rates first start to climb, there's a buying rush because a lot of buyers have held rates. Yes. They have those fixed rates. Yes. And so those are, those are good for 90 days in yes. most cases. So we were just talking before we came on air that the rates that you can get now are not what they were three, four weeks ago. The last right? four weeks has been hell. And in the commercial world, in some cases, you cannot hold those rates. Um, so if you were well, a buyer, <laughs> if, you, if you were a buyer who got a great rate five weeks ago, you're kind of on the clock right now. Yeah. Right. You're thinking, gosh, I, I want to find a place. I want to lock in this rate because over the five year term, I'm going to end up ahead. So I might need to pull the trigger here. And I'm looking pretty good because that rate that I didn't love four weeks ago, I'm now kind of liking. Well, just to put in this, just so those numbers are out there, like your rate that you're probably holding right now is probably a four, six, nine. And if you let go of that, your next rate you're going to get is five, six, nine. Like actually, you're, so, you're going to run 80 to 100 points. If again, you let go of your rate. Again, we're into that fear of missing out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I better capture this right now in this moment. So we're going to have this, this crescent. And then the new people that enter the market, um, you know, they're going to be dealing with, again, higher rates. And that'll hopefully see us, you know, uh, what we were Q3 and Q4. And again, do you remember in Q4 of last year, trying to get someone to pull the trigger on something, how difficult it was? It was, it was silence. It was and, silence. And, and as a buyer's agent, ridiculous. you're like trying to keep their energy up. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, Date the rate, marry the house, or what goes up must come down, or all these things. Like, it's like, well, the 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 validity in that moment was what we were talking about, which is your rate is up, but you can actually get the house for cheap. And I have some people who bought Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year, yeah, and in some cases really well. were buying off market, yeah, right. And did we phenomenal. did really good. We did really good because they captured that moment of sellers thinking, let's just do a deal here. Um, Market's going to shit, you know, but still the rate rates not as bad as they are now, like that was a really good moment in time. And I think right now, some people with rate holds are, are buying aggressively. Now, as we transfer into what we think your mindset should be and the investment world, before I go there, I want to just say like listening to this, like I'm listening to us speak. I'm like, it is so housing is such a stressful right now. Stressful. Well, even before, yeah. because it was like the, pan, the, the pandemonium of just like trying to get in and you're missing out and prices are running through the roof. And if you're trying to rent, it's been so out of, out of control. Like, dude, I've been doing this for 14 years. The stakes were lower. Like they just were, man. This they were last lower. three to five years, three years, three years, three to four years, I'd say. Yeah. It's been just like even whether you rent or own, yeah, it it's sucks. Pandemonium. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It consumes you completely. Yeah. It's so brutal. It's why some people get exhausted and actually take themselves out of the market. They're like, you know what? I can't. I can't right now. Dude, I, I get it. I'm like, I see why people... I also saw a thing of like... I forget what the clip was and who it was of, but they're like, you wonder why uh, everyone wants a socialistic environment now and or wants to leave the country. And it's because you work in a place that's uh, capitalist. You get a degree. You spend all this money, time, and energy. And you go out and get a good job. And you can't afford to rent or buy. And so it's like, how, why would you actually support the system? They're, they're, like, mm -hmm. again, why would people support a capitalistic system when this is the situation that they're in? Um, again, well, and I, is, I, I, think I think that's what that's, happens when you hedge your bet between socialism and capitalism. Like, you know, it, you gotta, you gotta ride with one, man. Like we're, we're trying yeah. to have more cake and eat too, but I don't want to get too far down. I know, that. I'm not saying that, but um, I'm just, I just, anyways, I just yeah. got like, I'm just like, this is craziness. Like I, I, well, this was the thing when I was thinking about this episode, like, and I don't even want to, I was thinking, I don't even want to get into the mental health side of this because we're that coming sucks. for that crisis because housing and mental health, they <sighs> move together yeah. um, for better or for worse. And a lot of that is already sort of showing its results at the, at the most extreme ends. I mean, even think of like these houses that just burned down and what those families are going through and what they're going to go yeah, through for 36 months. Yeah. And that's going to sound crazy to some people, but I'm telling you, think of moving, think of building, think of the time. And then how long does it take you to recover from that? Say nothing for the PTSD with. and all of that. Like this, this is going to be just really difficult for people. Um, and, and out of respect for the seriousness of that, I'm not going to just like talk about the mental health side of, of real estate and, and 
try to get on that because that's such a full conversation. Um, but it is, it is a stressful time. The thing I think is going to shift a little bit with the sellers, and you touched on it a bit, mm. is there's going to be a, an element of battening down the hatches. I think there should be. And this leads into what I think people should do a little bit. I think to some degree, you've got to batten down the hatches. I think there's going to be challenging times ahead. Oh. Yeah, we're going to have some hurricanes this summer. Actually, apparently, we're not going to have that many hurricanes this summer. That's good. That's, That's good. finally some good news uh, for here, us here on the East Coast. It's like when things are, you know... You mean like cost-cutting? Cost-cutting and, and maybe just not rocking the boat. So you're a seller... Selling's a big decision as well. People think just because it's been so hot as a seller the last few years, like, oh my gosh, must be nice to a seller. No, man, selling kind of sucks. It's a big process. It's they a have lot to for buy you and your or rent on the other And they end. often have to buy or rent. So if you're looking at uncertain times, like maybe it's uncertain times about your own buying power, uncertain times about your expenses, and uncertain times about real estate in general, that could be enough to make you as a seller just say, you know what? Maybe I'm just going to sit pat. Like I know what my finances are for the next, you know, 24 months, if that's all that's remaining on my term mm -hmm. or even the next 12 months, maybe I need to just hold the fort down and not make a move. And the challenge with that is it's just going to further contract the supply, which then puts more buying pressure. But I could see a lot of sellers starting to think that way because for a while, everyone was very excited. Oh my gosh, my home is worth so much more and money is really cheap. I would be foolish to not house upgrade at this time. Mm -hmm. Now everything's maybe a little less rosy. I could see some people on the selling side starting to take the, the, the stance or, or starting to think about maybe I just enjoy the fact that I've got a great house over my head. I've got bills that I feel comfortable with. Yeah. And I've got some predictability in my life for 12 or 24 months, which is more than a lot of people can say. Yeah. So I could see some sellers starting to think about that, which is obviously is in balance against the idea of cashing in, you know, the market's hot, hot right now. Um, yeah. So that's the seller psychology that I think is at play right now. Yeah. Interesting. And I think moving forward, it's going to have to be more that way. I mean, I've always felt nervous about selling and I'm thinking about selling a property now that, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to get that property back. Right. Like if I sell this, I'm never yeah. going to buy it again. And I have a lot of anxiety about where my children are going to live. I've talked about this on this show mm -hmm. a few times and so some of my decision-making is based on where I think they're going to live attic. 10 to 15 years from now. Your attic. My attic? Yeah, they're, they're probably going to live in my attic. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, you know, getting a property ready for sale right now, and I'm going between two things. One, did I miss the peak? Am I foolish? Should I have sold this <laughs> Going through all the same thing ago? as clients yeah. are. On the other side, even if I sell this in and get a great number for it, am I going to be disappointed that I didn't keep it? Because I've sold two things before. And there are many days that I wish I still had Lexus and uh, the Lexus. No scooter. No, I sold two houses before oh. to clarify. I mean, I sold a nicer house on the same street that I'm about to sell this current property for. So I had a house on the street and I sold it at what was just a crazy hot market for 387. And now I'm going to sell another property that is not probably worth as much. And I'm hoping to sell it for twice as much, right? Like that's how much, that market has appreciated. It's like a riddle, and, and I think so I know what property it is. I, I sometimes regret selling that other property because I could have it now to sell. But obviously, like I took that equity, I did other things with it, and so on. And so I can I can make myself okay with it. But I have that fear about selling this property. Am I selling too early? Am I selling too late? Am I going to regret this? It's not a simple, straightforward. So you're telling yourself not to sell. No, not at all. Like I'm I am planning to sell this property, but I'm just saying it's a difficult decision. But part of the reason I'm selling it is because I do think there are lean times ahead and that having some cash and getting a bit flush is not a bad idea right now. Agreed. I second that exactly. Uh, almost actually exactly to what you said. That's a rare occasion. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, 100%. I think people should be battening down the hatches. I think if there's an option to take a fixed rate that you're comfortable with, I'm still going to stand by that and say that I think that's not the worst idea in the world simply for peace of mind. Uh, because I think there's potential for more rate hikes and other issues out in the market. Uh, and so having some consistency there is is super important, at least in my eyes. Um, and or if you're on the flip side of like, I can just barely squeak it and I think I'd rather get rid of the stressor, you might have an opportunity here to make your last attempt. Last, Not last attempt, but I think it's a good time to make an attempt to 
clean house mm-hmm. and and offload some stuff. And I think we are seeing that with some people that are calling. Uh, I know, like we with the team, we're getting a lot of calls for people who are just I think looking to get rid of some auxiliary properties, um, or some. A lot of people bought rental properties during this time that just are finding out I don't really want to do this. Yeah. It's just, it's not my cup of tea. It's not something I'm interested in doing. Or maybe um, I can't float this loss of $400 a month that I thought I could eat for some time because no big deal. It's it's a good passive investment. Yep. My equity is growing and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm not cut out for that or maybe I can't swing it financially or maybe just the stress that it's causing in my life is causing these other things. Because, I mean, I know I had the tenants of this property effectively say, gosh, is, is it us? Like, we will happily pay more rent because... You know, no one, plug your ears, folks. I didn't raise the rent in like five years, maybe more. I think one of the guys may be there for six years. I never raised the rent. Great tenants, you know, and it was a different time. Let's put it that way, <laughs> right? Um, and so I'm under, I was underwater on that property mm-hmm. most recently, only, only in recent memory. And I, did, I didn't mind. They were great. The equity is good and, and no problem. And so they, one of them, especially, he sort of felt that maybe this was because I was underwater on the property and he very generously offered to pay more rent because he didn't want to move either. Yep. But I explained to him, it wasn't about that. Yeah, sure. That would be great. And, and so on and so forth. But it was more so concerned for my overall portfolio, mm-hmm. the future, and just the lifestyle that I want to live and knowing that um, less stress is best at any time, but also less stress when you're potentially headed into stressful times that are yep. beyond your control. Yep. Well, maybe this is a good time to take control of a couple things that you can. When are you selling that place? Um, it should go on the market the first week of July. Duplex? Duplex. Two units vacant. Nice, too. Yeah. Um, Freshly painted. It's the brightest property in the neighborhood. I am going to run through it with cinnamon sticks. Yes. Get your cinnamon, boiled cinnamon <laughs> sticks ready. Um, so. Okay. All this being said. Yeah. Where the hell should investors be at? Like, what are people thinking right now? Um, do I let you go first or do I say what I'm thinking? Uh, I, I've talked a lot. You say what you're thinking. Okay. I'm, I'm in a weird boat right now. And I'm, I'm basically expressing almost how I feel about what I'm thinking about doing. But I'm very much in almost a, a standby type situation. Uh, actively and consistently pursuing deals. And I think buying opportunities are still available, but you need to be extremely prudent and you want to make sure that they're home run deals. Mm -hmm. So anything that you were banking on a rent that's a little high um, and like the numbers all had to work out perfectly and the margins were thin, like those deals before you were doing them and then it just worked out every time that they were worth a little more at the end and the rents were always a little bit better. Um, Like none of that shit. You got to be doing deals and you got to run your worst case and it's still got to be like a slam dunk. Like it's got to mm-hmm. be a banging deal. So I think those deals are still an opportunity. Um, depending on what your model is, if you're simply investing and not getting into an active business of like rehabbing and, and doing things to the property. Um, I think, again, there's opportunities that are popping up all over the place and they're at per door values, in my opinion, that are cheaper than constructing new. Mm-hmm. And I think that ultimately ends up protecting a lot of these places because the cost of construction is not going to not going to wane. The vacancy is overnight not going to drop. And so even if rents drop a little bit, if you're buying existing product, you're probably without doing a major turnover and you're comfortable with the numbers it runs now, uh, you're fine. And you're, you're probably at a rental rate that's so much lower than market anyways. You're not really at risk of any major exposure. Um, so that is still an opportunity. But again, shopping aggressively, maintain that you should always be doing that. But I don't think buying aggressively is is necessarily the way unless it's a good deal. Um, this is something I've been kind of saying and I was chatting with someone and like, well, like you shouldn't be concerned about losing money on it. It's an investment you're going to sit on and it'll come back around. And I'm like, I agree. Mm-hmm. And I'm not concerned about that. I'm actually more concerned about the opportunity cost of tying up my cash into a project when I think there could be an opportunity for a better deal. Mm-hmm. Because I think there's yeah. home run deals. I don't think it's going to be like, again, I'm not saying it's like there's going to be blood in the streets and then like, there's apartment buildings, 30 units going for a million bucks. Like just people are going bankrupt all over the place. I don't think it's going to happen at all, at all. I don't think it's going to be the case. But I do think that there's, that now's the time where you can be a bit more selective. You don't have to be like, uh, I don't love this neighborhood. Uh, this is a bit of a janky building. Uh, like this doesn't really line up. Like all those things that we were kind of ignoring before, now's a good time to be like, okay, like this is a bit janky. So I'm probably just going to wait until it's a little bit cleaner building. 
or like, oh, the numbers aren't that great, so I'm going to wait till it's a better building. Or the neighborhood's not one that I'm close to or easy to manage or I'm interested in being in, so I'll wait a little longer. Like, I think that's the mindset to take and to really squeeze and look at your numbers. Um, and I have one investor who I find it's, it's really an interesting way of looking at stuff, but he, it's really smart. But he just, he literally, every place we go at, he's like, okay, and he's buying commercially. Uh, okay, the dupl- duplex is 600000 bucks. Okay, well, I'm going to borrow the money at 7% because that's what a bank rate right now is going to be, 7% on an investment like that. Uh, so he's like, yeah, it's $42,000 a year just in interest. He's like, I don't care about the cash flow because I can float the thing. So $42,000 a year in interest, that's whatever, 3500 bucks a month. That's literally 3500 $3,500 a month just in interest payments on a duplex. So mm-hmm. That means seventeen fifty from each unit is going just to interest. That's not including your actual principal of your mortgage, your property taxes, your insurance, your water, all the other shit that goes into that. And you're like, mm, is this that exciting right now? Mm-hmm. I don't know. And so it's a good time to, again, to review those things and be prudent and, and like really quickly you can, you can be like, mm, this place doesn't make sense to me without you know what i mean yeah um so I think that's, just that's just my to mindset that, on that yeah yeah let me let me chime in there i i do agree with um all of that really i think you're right it's just uh everyone got caught up in the frenzy we talked a lot the fomo the you know the horse leaving the barn the catch the wave the whatever you want to call it everyone was in that and there was this prevailing idea that it doesn't matter because the price is going to be up anyway 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 so i think it is a time to sharpen the pencil a little bit yeah Make sure that this is an opportunity that came to you in the right way and for the right reasons and is actually an opportunity and not just something you are chasing because it's there, yep. right? Um, because I do think there are those opportunities and there are going to continue to be some of those opportunities and all the more reason to, to potentially be liquid in ways that you can be liquid at this moment so that you can capitalize on this. Yep. Which is the other reason I'm getting liquid because... Some days I'm like, I may never buy anything again. But man, if I clear some capital and I see a deal, I know I'm going to buy it. He's definitely right? going to buy it. Um, so all Chile needs to see is like a nice looking triplex. <laughs> don't start. And he will he will liquidate everything don't for start. that triplex. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I, I definitely think there's that. I think there's also um, that it's a good time to maybe lean into what you know you're good at. Right? If you know you're good at doing rehabs of six unit buildings, maybe it's a good time to continue to focus on that and not try to get into adding a backyard suite. You know what I mean? Like if that's not your bag and that's not something you've tried before, maybe this isn't the time. Or maybe you know that like, you know, your sweet spot is 12 to 20 units and, you know, maybe not getting the really good deal on the six unit that's going to bring, you know, a lot of stress, but you know, maybe doesn't return you the ROI that you want and what you get on your better project. Like lean into what you do best. So maybe don't switch to doing a commercial conversion right now or the backyard suite, as I mentioned, or, you know, just, oh, I got a really good deal on an industrial place. Okay, cool. Like that might be great, but maybe this isn't the time to be trying something new. Maybe this is the time to lean into what you're good at because you know those numbers and you can make sure you're assessing good deals, but also work on the existing stock you have. Like maybe there are inefficiencies in your existing stock that you haven't really been tending to because you're doing all these other things. I'm working on that. So let's tighten what we already have. Yeah. Like the best, you can go out there and you can try to find a place, a unit that maybe makes you 300 bucks extra a month. Or you can take an existing unit you have and find a way to make it more efficient and get 300 bucks or less, which is cheaper. Like the latter costs you no down payment, no closing costs, no due diligence expense. So like maybe there are opportunities to add units. Like the backyard suite was something I was very much considering at, at a property, um, adding a basement, unit, all of these other things, you can get those at a cheaper price per door than going out and buying new product. Maybe they're a better fit. So just figure out what it is that you are good at and what's your highest return and do that rather than chasing the new shiny thing. I saw, did you get a design build quote for the secondary suite in the backyard? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. I was super curious to see what you got for pricing. Yeah, I mean, I heard numbers of one ninety to two forty, and then I but then I know someone who just for did eight hundred square feet. Yeah, maybe a bit less, but yeah, around there. So two fifty, probably six hundred and fifty square feet. 
Um, 300 square foot. But then uh, I heard of someone who did one, a two bedroom that's like 800 square feet and ended up being like 290 all in by the time they're done. Yeah, that makes sense. But they also got an appraisal for like 450 or something. It's a second. freaking house. It's a house and they'll rent really good. But also, show me where you can add a brand new construction two bedroom unit for 290,000 bucks. Brand new construction with no rent control, like top of the market rent. Like you can't go out and buy a duplex for $580,000, brand new construction. And you can't you buy know, a single bedrooms. family home for 290. Yeah. So uh, it, that is an example of like, okay, that makes sense. And maybe that's what I'm going to try to do right now instead of chasing after these. I like that idea of, it, of trying to go after the efficiencies of your own properties. There's probably lots of little things you can do to clean them up because there's the other aspect. I think we've kind of alluded to it in the original episode this week is just like people are not paying rent and the main concept there is, and we've talked about this before is affordability is going to become, is, I th- well, not going to become, it is an issue. But like when I say affordability, I mean like for everybody where they just physically cannot make their payments, they cannot pay their rent. And so I think what will happen is you'll see some of the top end rents maybe come down a little bit to try and maintain their, their vacancies, uh, which ultimately trickles through the whole market. And so you're going to start to see people potentially have lower rents and it'll cause turnover out of your buildings. Mm-hmm. And so are your units or your houses. And so you want to make sure that clean up all the little things that need to be fixed, mm-hmm. uh, make it an enjoyable space for your tenants, like pro- maintain the mm-hmm. properties. I think now is a good time to, to, to do stuff like that. Add the heat pump. If you, if you think it's a good idea, like, like there's there's lots of stuff like that that I think is in now like you said a great time to do it do some some landscaping like just all those kinds of things because a lot of that's been pushed to the wayside yeah because you could um and and maybe not many people have already been doing that but I I do think when I drive around I see a lot of people are just in like a main like a, they were in a manic state trying to get as much done as many properties as they could po- and, and they were just ignoring a lot of the small things um but uh, yeah yeah I think. So that's a good recap, I think, of the psychology of what's going on in the market. A little bit of summary of how it's always at play, why it's more at play right now, and how that could impact what's going forward. Like, we don't know what's going on with the future. I think there are, if, if nothing else, there's a reason for caution, right? Yep. Even if you don't have to make wide sweeping changes in your life, I think there's a reason for caution. Sharpen that, that, that pencil. Sharpen the pencil. Also, like, man, if you're into this stuff, Ego is the Enemy is a cool book. Mm. Um, you know, grit, power of habit, those sort of things are kind of interesting for procrastination mm-hmm. and, and motivation and all this stuff. So I think understanding your own psychology is really cool and it really helps you understand. I just read Atomic Habits. That was a pretty good book. Atomic Habits, yeah, that that's nice. a really good one. Yeah, um, so check those out if you want some extra reading. Um, be curious to hear your thoughts and how maybe your mindset is shifting in this market right now, uh, what your outcasts or what your, sorry, your forecasts are, your outlook, all that good stuff, so. I also, like this is not an episode as a plug for this, but I will have some alternative investment opportunities that you could hedge on uh, temporarily while you shop for a great deal. There you go. DM Neil for his small, what did you say? Uh, How would you describe it? I said an opportunity where you could place your funds to hedge yourself against the market in the interim. Wow. Look at that. Sounds juicy, people. Hit them up. Thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe. But also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. Broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.